So we're in uh, John chapter 20 and I've called this message Signs of Life. You won't get it for at least a little while. (laughs) So John chapter 20, uh, we're actually going to focus in on the last couple of verses. There they are. Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. But these are that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and by believing have life in his name. On the surface it seems pretty straightforward. He's just telling us why he's writing his book. He hopes people will get converted. But let's look a little deeper. We've been in John for a few months now and you would have noticed that John is different. John is very different. If you divide the Gospels, there's John and everything else. Um, there's stuff in John that's not in the synoptics. We call them synoptics from seeing things the same way. There's loads of unique material in John and there's heaps uh, of synoptic material that's not in John. Why is John so different? Well, the answer is here. If you're listening on the tape and you haven't got the PowerPoint, it looks like a rocky island. And this next view has more of the rocky island and the most beautiful woman in the world is standing on the beach there. (laughs) You're on your own now, you should get the PowerPoint if you're listening. (laughs) So what is the secret here? Well, where are we? There's that part of the world and we're on that tiny little island. Does anyone know what we're talking about? Patmos. So why are we talking about Patmos? John was sent there. He was exiled. Church tradition said the Emperor Domitian put him in a pot of boiling oil and he was unharmed. Um, But uh, his response then was to exile him to this little barren rocky island um, thinking what harm can he do there? Uh, There's not a thriving thoroughfare of people, there's no sort of commerce, okay he might convert a couple of bodies there, big deal. It was in a sense a concession um, to John's resilience. So we're on Patmos and there's modern day Patmos. I took that sailing in on the ferry to Patmos a couple of years ago What is there to do? You can go to Chrissy's motorbike shop um, and hire little scooters. So here's Les and Carmel on their scooter. Um, And you jump on the scooters and there's a sort of a hill, it's not even really a mountain, it's a a hill uh, and you ride up the hill. Now our scooter could get up the hill all right, but Les and Carmel, once there was a bit of a slope, Carmel had to get off and then after a little while Les had to get off and push it. But our scooter got all the way to the top and what do you find at the top? There's a monastery dedicated to John. So that wasn't there in John's time. Uh, He probably wouldn't have appreciated all the gold art anyway. Um, There's me at the monastery looking out across the view. There's Karen enjoying the view and there it is, it's a, it's a little island sort of shaped a bit like a figure eight, it's got a narrow bit and, and two wide bits. Halfway down the island um, there's this which is the entrance to the cave where John was said to have gotten the revelation and you go through this little um, simple gift shop, after that you're not allowed to take any pictures but it's just a little cave. Um, and there's a crack in the roof um, where the angel is supposed to have sent his message to John, but it's just a little cave. You can swim on uh, one of the beaches there. There's Les and Carmel swimming in the beach. You can ride around the other side of the island um, and sit there, wait for the sun to go down and watch the sunset over the Aegean. How many sunsets did John watch from Patmos? How many years was he there? He was there a long time. Synoptics have been out for a long time. So as he compiles his gospel, he reflects. 
What has he got to do? He certainly taught people, he led them to the Lord, he grew them, he loved them, um, and he compiled his gospel as well as the book of Revelation. God gives John time, time and space for deep consecutive thought. And John's gospel is the result. So, what he's saying is that there are signs. There are no miracles in John. You won't find the word miracle in the book of John. And before someone Googles it, um, there's one occurrence in the NIV, but the Greek word is ergon, which is, of course, work. So, there are no miracles in John, but what are there? There are signs. What are signs? What, what do they do? What's their purpose? To point to something, aren't they? Keep off the grass. No parking. So signs point to things. And for John, he picked just a handful, seven signs, because they had deeper meaning. And the meaning is here. Can you see what he's saying? If you get these signs, and if you trust in them, if you put in faith, if you put in belief, faith, trust and action, then there's life for you to be had. So my theory is that John's picked these signs because there's life to be had for us. So there are lots of other things he did, but these, if you'll insert faith personally, you will get life out of it. Put in faith, let's get life. So... What are we going to do? Well, um, I'm going to skip through, I'll, I'll walk you through one and then I'll nimble quickly through a second and spend about 30 seconds on a third. I'm going to leave you the rest. So what was the first sign in John? Yes, thank you. The wedding at Cana. Here's a nice artist painting. Can you tell who the religious people are? <laughs> The halo is a giveaway, isn't it? So Mary's come to Jesus. What do we know about this story? What do, what do we know? I ran out of wine. Big deal? Huge deal. So these weddings go on for a week. And the shame of running out of wine would have carried this couple, would have carried with them for their whole lives. That's the couple that ran out of wine. You invited everyone, you invited the poor to this week-long celebration uh, and wine was essential and to run out was a huge shame. Yeah, what else do we know? Yeah, Mary goes to Jesus and says, ah, oh, they run out of wine. And he says, it's not my time yet. And she says, oh, okay. No, she doesn't. <laughs> what does she say? She goes to the servants and says, what he says, do. In the Greek, it's pretty abrupt. Whatever he says, do it. And then what does he say? He told the servants to fill up the water jugs. So in this painting, they don't really get the right idea. These are the little portable jugs. But the ones John's talking about are huge. He even gives a capacity, 20 to 30 gallons. How many litres is that? How do you convert? How many litres in a gallon? Four litres in a gallon. So 20 to 30 becomes how many? They are different. They are different. So we're talking several hundred litres. So that would have meant them going to the well with their little ones, coming back, filling them up. Here's some more sort of to scale pots. Here's one in a church on the spot. In Cana there, they built a church and they've gotten this uh, limestone, what's left of uh, a, a big water container from that time. So the servants have to do all the work. Here's some a little bit better preserved. So, what do you think the sign means? John's picked it, remember? The other guys don't even mention it. Faith 
Yeah. What do you think the water represents? In the desert culture, water means life. But in this context, something ordinary, every day. So we're starting with the big pots. What are they for? John tells us what they're for. The ceremonial washing, so the ritual washing. You come in, they draw out water, you wash your hands. It's a ritual, it's part of the, the cleanliness culture. So it's an external cleansing with water. Yep, how many pots were there? Six. Does it matter? Do numbers mean stuff? What does six mean? It means man. What else does it mean? <laughs> Imperfection. Incomplete. Um, so six has a... There were six, but John's want us just to know that there are six because six has meaning. So we've got water, we've got external cleansing, we've got ritual, uh, and we've got imperfection. And then what does wine mean? The rabbis had a saying, without wine there is no joy. <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting that drunkenness was a great disgrace, but wine was a part of culture and particularly it was a part of celebratory relationships, fellowship, um, you know, part of a picture of even glory, heaven, getting together. What else? What sort of wine was it? The best. The best awesomeness, excellence. And how much? Heaps. So you've got this idea. We're going to get there. So ordinary water, ritual cleansing, external man, imperfection, all of that turning into excellence, abundance, joy, fellowship, festivity, abundance, glory. So you can see what John's trying to say. Turning water into wine is what God does. That tells us about, that's a sign about the nature of God. It's what he does, he can't help but do that. He comes into a situation and he turns water into wine. But there's something else he wants us to get. What else? <laughs> it's what we're supposed to do too. This is a picture for life in God, remember? Life in his name. If you get this... You'll unlock life. So turning water into wine is what we're supposed to do. That's part of our job description. So when I work in the surgery, I wash my hands two or three times with every patient. So do you think I should have a glass of wine instead? <laughs> How would that go, do you think? <laughs> I'd be dozing on the desk by about morning tea time. <laughs> But what if instead, when I wash my hands, I think, I wonder what turning water into wine means right now? It might mean going off script, asking something a bit unexpected, showing a little bit of compassion, some curiosity, being grateful for something, just a little piece of joy, brightness, light. That would be fun, wouldn't it? Water into wine, it's what we're supposed to do. If we try to do it in our own strength, what happens? We'll very quickly run dry. And what will we need to do? We'll need to get in touch with the source of the wine. We'll need the spirit. If it feels like a demand on us, we've got it upside down. They're actually little acts of worship. Listen to Romans. Here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life. You're sleeping, eating, going to work, walking around life. Put it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you. Don't be so well adjusted to your culture that you fit in without thinking. Focus your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Recognise what he wants from you. Respond to it. Can you see the picture there of, of wine flowing out of you? Focus on Jesus, get self out of the way and let the wine flow. 
So in this first sign we can say, yeah, it's a picture of God, but it's also a picture of life in God, isn't it? And there's a secret. If we try to do it, it'll unlock something magical. What was the second sign? I'll give you a picture. It's a little bit like the centurion. This is the royal official who comes. He hears Jesus has come back to Cana and he travels from Capernaum, a couple of days journey, and he gets to him and he asks and asks and asks and asks in the tents, the Greek tents. What's he asking? Please come, my son's really, really sick. Come and you can heal him. He's possibly heard and seen what Jesus has done in his miracles before. Now in context, Jesus has just been talking about how a prophet's got no honour in his own town and people won't believe without signs and miracles. And this guy says, come and you can heal my son. And what does Jesus say? Go home, your son lives. And what does the man do? He leaves. He goes home. <laughs> Look at that. The man takes him at his word and goes home. So what's going on here? What's the point of this? Jesus is saying, okay, you believe in me as a miracle worker who could come to your home, touch your son and heal him. That's good, but... Can you possibly believe in someone who could heal without even coming? Can your faith stretch that far? And he said, yes. So what's the point of this second miracle? What's the sign? It says something about God, his bigness. What does it say about us and life in him? Trust, Trust yeah. Have you ever thought, yeah, a bit like Martha to Jesus, if only you'd been here, Jesus, Lazarus wouldn't have died. She's got a picture of God that's big enough that could have healed a sick Lazarus, but it's not big enough for someone to raise someone from the dead. Someone has talked about following a God of small miracles. Our problems are too big. Okay, some of them I can understand God could work in that. He's a big God, but just can't do this, which makes me fearful. Can you see what he's trying to do? If we latched on to the bigness of God, his ability, his power and his interest in us, if we were able to put that together, a bigger view of God, what would happen to our problems? What would happen to our fear? What would happen to our faith? Would we trust him more? Let's really quickly look at one more sign, a bit of a clue there. What's going on there? <laughs> Feeding of the 5,000. So a great big crowd. Jesus says, where could we buy enough bread to feed all these people? And the disciples say, that would take a fortune, far more money than we can even imagine. That's going to take a fortune. And then someone says, oh, there's a little boy here with a couple of fish and loaves. But what good is that? What happens? Jesus uses it, doesn't he? What do you think this sign means? Sure, it's a picture of God, but what is it about life in God for us? Abundance, yes. Where did that abundance come from? Yeah, the little boy who gave him what he had and God magnified it. He didn't make it out of nothing. He took a little boy's faith, didn't he? So it said it doesn't matter what your problems are, what your demands are, what your resources are. But whose hands are you putting what you have in? So John's had time to think and he's worked out these signs are actually secrets to be unlocked. If you insert faith to each of these signs, you unpack something magical about life in God. We touched on three, turning water into wine in everyday life. Stretching our view of God to be bigger than we've thought before. Giving what we have to Him. 
And after that, when he talked about the bread of life, I'm the bread of life, you've got to eat me, I want you to be sustained by me. These are written that you might have life. John had an enormously intimate relationship with Jesus and then Jesus left and John was the one who got to have time to reflect, lead people to the Lord, to disciple them, to grow them, to try to teach them about life in God. And these are the signs that he's given us that we might know life. Treasure maps to follow, gifts to unlock. I give them to 